Welcome back to MCB 170, Society and the Brain. This is lecture 15, which corresponds to part one of module eight. The title of module eight is Us Versus Them. In module eight, we'll be discussing human group orientation, group affiliation, the, the tendency for human beings to form groups around shared characteristics, shared attitudes, shared interests, etc. Before I get started, I'd like to ask you a question. If you had to describe yourself to another person, if you had to describe yourself to a person you had never met, what are five things you would say about yourself? Five things you would say about yourself that would give that person, in your opinion, in your, in your judgment, a good, a good idea of what you're about. What would be those five things? Well, it wouldn't surprise me if you included beautiful or intelligent or sophisticated because all of the students who take this course are beautiful and intelligent and sophisticated. But it also wouldn't surprise me if you included a political identification Right now, the United States is highly politically polarized, and many people would identify themselves as either Democrat or Republican. They feel that by stating that political identification, they're communicating something very important about themselves. It also wouldn't surprise me if you mentioned a religious affiliation. Billions of people in the world today in fact, half of all humanity identifies with one of the five great religions, which are in no political, no particular order, Hinduism, Buddhism, Judaism, Christianity, Islam. You might also have mentioned your generational membership. This is a collage depicting the Woodstock generation otherwise known as the baby boom generation. I'm a member of the baby boom generation. And I get the impression that people have gotten tired of the baby boom generation. Most of the students taking this course are probably members of iGen, people born after like 1997. I actually like iGen. I think iGen is a terrific generation and I think that you people will do great things in the future. The larger point is that so much of our personal identification is group identification. That we feel that an important, an important part of who we are has to do with the group in which we belong. Why is that? Well, humans tend to form groups and to develop generalizations. They tend to develop generalizations concerning their own group, which is called the in-group, and other groups, which would by definition be out-groups. And there are two main theories for this, the social cognitive and the, and the social identity theories. You can kind of think of them as the more or less negative and more or less positive sides of human group affiliation. The social cognitive theory says that Social categorization, categorizing people to different groups, is an efficient, but often inaccurate, way to conceive of one's in-group and to relate it to one's out-groups. So we tend to think that everybody in our group is wonderful and everybody in the other group is terrible and lazy and criminal. When it comes to categorization on the basis of race, it's clear that that's not the case. It's clear that that isn't true because every race encompasses the full spectrum of personality. You have all the personality types within one race. If you could even measure the average of a, of a particular race on some particular trait, those averages would be a lot closer together than the variation within either race. So social categorization on the basis of generalization is just plain wrong. Why do we do it? 
Well, because there are so many different people that if we had to take everybody as an individual, we might feel cognitively overwhelmed. So we take the cognitive expedient of generalization and categorization to kind of help us out with that. That doesn't make it right, but that's what we do. And as I'll explain a little bit later in the lecture, generalization is a large part of how the brain actually works. The social identity theory says the development of an in-group concept establishes the positive distinctiveness of the group from which group members derive personal esteem. That's not so bad necessarily. If you're a member of a group, you wanna make sure that that group is, is worthy so that you'll be proud to identify with them. In any case, the social cognitive and social identity theories of human group affiliation are not mutually exclusive. They're not mutually exclusive. They can easily coexist together and they usually do. The fact remains that birds of a feather flock together. And this expression is true of human beings. Is it true of non-humans? Well, birds of the same species will flock together. Fish of the same species will school together. Chimpanzees of the same species will group together, troop together. But human beings will subdivide within their species. Do other animals do that? Yes, absolutely. Consider, for example, primates and canines. Among primates, consider the chimpanzees. Chimpanzees are highly territorial. They form troops within the species of chimpanzee. And the two different troops can, can fight aggressively for territory. The same is true for canines. Canines are also highly territorial. Consider wolves. Packs of wolves, same species, different pack, will compete aggressively for territory. Do animals associate on the basis of shared characteristics? Are all the members of a troop of chimpanzees similar in some way and different from the chimpanzees in another group? Probably not. Probably not. Assortment on the basis of shared characteristics is probably a human thing. It's not clear if it actually happens in animals. The Sneetches are a fictitious type of bird invented by Dr. Zeus, which demonstrate certain aspects of group affiliation, mostly negative because the, our tendency to want to associate into groups and to develop generalizations about our group and our groups has serious consequences. Psychological experiments show that viewing a person as a member of a group has profound consequences for how people process information about others, feel about others, and act toward others. The assignment of people to groups, which are often based on completely arbitrary criteria in the famous story of the Sneetches, Sneetches distinguished themselves on the basis of whether or not they had a green star on their belly. This assignment is sufficient to produce prejudice, both in favor of members of one's own group and against members of another group. That's the real downside to the human tendency to form groups. So what are some of these consequences? Here are the two main ones, the first two. The consequences of categorizing people into groups include minimization of differences between groups and exaggeration of differences between groups. Obviously not true. Within any group of people, there's gonna be a very, very high variance. But between any two groups of people, the averages are very close together. So a moment's reflection convinces you, especially when it comes to racial groups, that these consequences are pernicious and, and not based on reality. Other consequences are improvement for mem of memory for ways in which in-group members are similar to the self and improvement of memory for ways in which out-group members are dissimilar from the self. 
Also experience of positive affect toward in-group members, which is nicer to people who are in our group. Perception of in-group members being more trustworthy. We tend to trust people from our same group. And we have an increased willingness to help our in-group members. All of these are profound consequences of the tendency for humans to form groups. Intergroup bias is real, and it's an unfortunate but often studied aspect of human group interaction. And it has correlates on the neural level. Let's consider some of those. In this experiment, subjects, either, na either native Japanese or Caucasian American, had to infer to decode or to guess the mental or emotional state of a person from an image of their eyes. So here's an example. Black and white pictures only of the eye region of the face. Native Japanese or Caucasian American. Can you guess the mental state, the emotional state of each image? There are only four choices, same for both faces irritated, sarcastic, worried, or friendly. When you look at the eyes of those two individuals, do you think the individual is irritated, sarcastic, worried, or friendly? What would you guess? The mental state, emotional state, of both images shown is worried. I wouldn't have guessed that for either. This face looks kind of friendly, to me, this face looks kind of sarcastic. I wouldn't have guessed worried for either. Maybe I'm not good at, at inferring emotions. But performance in this experiment depended upon ethnicity. The Japanese were better at decoding Japanese eye images, while the Caucasian Americans were better at decoding Caucasian American eye images. And here's the data. Japanese subjects, these were all college students like you, by the way, white American students. The Japanese were better at decoding the Japanese faces, and the Caucasian Americans were better at decoding Caucasian American faces, probably not surprisingly. So what was the neural correlate? This task activated the superior temporal sulcus on both sides. The superior temporal sulcus. We haven't talked about that much yet, but we'll be talking about it um, today and especially in the next module because the STS is part of the mirror neuron system. The mirror neuron system is a system of interacting brain regions which among other things permits us to empathize with other people, to feel what other people are feeling. And in this experiment the amount of activity in the STS was larger when subjects viewed images of the eyes of people of their same ethnicity. So as I mentioned, the STS is part of the mirror neuron system. We'll be talking about the mirror neuron system in detail in the next module, but I do want you to remember the main parts of the mirror neuron system. The superior temporal sulcus, which we just talked about, the STS, the inferior parietal lobule, IPL, and the inferior frontal cortex, IFG. As it turns out, and as we'll discuss more in the next module, the STS is primarily a visual area, and it provides visual input to the IPL and the IFP. Let's review the visual system. Recall from previous modules that visual perception involves construction of complex features from many simpler features. The simplest features are spots of light. Already the retina, which is actually a complex neural tissue, it has five layers of neurons, is gonna take in the visual input and extract from that little spots of light. It's gonna detect these spots of light. It relays that to the lateral geniculate nucleus. The lateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus basically acts as a relay station from the retina to the cortex. Lateral geniculate projects to area V1, the first area of visual cortex, and it is in V1 that the most basic visual feature is extracted, oriented blobs, oriented bars or oriented blobs. As we go higher in the visual system, area V2 corners, area V4 simple shapes, as we move from the visual cortex, occipital cortex, into the temporal lobe, we get more complex shapes and finally 
far up in the temporal lobe, very, very complex shapes, including faces. Here's a, uh, an image of a monkey brain, front of the brain, back of the brain. This is the occipital lobe. Back here is the primary visual cortex, V1. As you move forward, you go for, to area V2, area V4, bars, corners, simple shapes, complex shapes. You start to move into the temporal lobe. Now you're in the facial. Now you're in the inferior temporal gyrus, the face area of the temporal lobe, a relatively big part of the temporal lobe, very high order temporal lobe. We've mentioned it several times in the course already. This part of the brain processes faces, identifies faces and identifies facial expressions. How many neurons would you say are in there? I would say roughly there's hundreds of millions, let's say 300 million different neurons in there, face region. So how is this organized? There's 300 million neurons in there. Is each of those 300 million neurons specialized for some particular face, at some particular angle, at some particular size, with glasses or without glasses, with a haircut or without a haircut? Maybe. But how many faces does it have to be able to recognize and identify? Well, there's probably 100 monkeys in a troop. This is a monkey brain. 100 monkeys in a troop. But every face has to be recognized at different sizes and different angles and different contrasts and different colors with many different combinations of attributes. But with all those different combinations, there's a combinatorial explosion of different images, different visual images, just of faces. There's, they're in there billions at least, if not trillions. The number of possible images of face, when you consider all the different visual attributes that can vary, is many, many times the number of neurons in the face area, in the infrotemporal cortex, even though there's 300 million of them. So how does it work? How does the brain organize all of that information? Well, a lot of low level and high level neural functioning involves generalization. The brain has to generalize. It just has too much information not to. A good example are face cells in the inferotemporal cortex, which generalize over faces. They have a preferred face. There is a face of a particular size and orientation and so on that they like the best. But each face cell also responds, but progressively less strongly, to faces that are progressively less and less similar to the preferred face. Okay, let's talk about that in more detail. This is a recording from a neuron in the face area in the infrotemporal cortex of a monkey. It's amazing. This can be done without hurting the monkey. And up here you see in this, this, this um, histogram plot the activity of that neuron. The higher the spikes and the more dense they are, the more active that neuron is. So here you see that neuron's response in a monkey when that monkey is looking at this monkey image, this face, and it likes it, it's very active. Is that the only monkey face it responds to? Nope, here's another monkey of a slightly different species. It also responds strongly to that face. Now, if you showed it a picture of a gorilla or of a squirrel, it probably wouldn't respond that strongly. But if you show it a picture of a human face, a bearded human face, you get a pretty good response. It responds about halfway. If you showed the monkey a human face without a beard, it wouldn't respond very much at all. If you show its favorite face, but scrambled up, it doesn't respond very much at all. If you show it a hand, it doesn't respond very much at all. So it's really specific for faces, but it's still kind of permissive. It'll respond to faces that aren't its favorite face. It'll respond to its fav one of its favorite, a, ver a very good, strong face, a face close to its preferred face, if you remove part of the face, but not as strongly. Here's a very interesting set of recordings. First of all, showing that this uh, particular cell doesn't really like a toilet brush very much. And, in, and here, the, the, the view of the monkey face is, is front, frontal. As the monkey turns its face, 
the response of that face diminishes. It gets smaller and smaller until it's almost not responding at all when, this, when the monkey is looking at the back of the head of the other monkey. You see that these neurons are specialized for a particular face at a particular orientation. They have a particular face and a particular set of visual attributes, angle, size, lighting, shading, that they like the best, but they'll respond but less to faces that are close to but not the same as their preferred face. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, let's say that all of the cells only responded to one specific face at one specific angle, one specific size, one specific, con specific contrast, and one specific set of other visual attributes. Then, if you showed that particular face, all of those 300 million neurons would be silent except for one. That one would respond. But that's not what happened. All of those 300 million have a preferred face. It's a different face, different face, a different, slightly different angle, different coloring, different shading, etc. They all have a preferred face, but they all respond to faces that are not their preferred face to a diminished extent. In fact, they're all telling the rest of the brain how close the image they're viewing at any particular time matches their preferred face. So what you end up with is 300 million neurons telling the rest of the brain how close that particular face that they're looking at is to their preferred face. And so there's a pattern over all those 300 million neurons determined by the preferred face of each one and the face that they happen to be looking at in the world of the moment. And it's that pattern activity over all those 300 million that allows the, that animal to recognize a particular face with a particular set of emotion. So the way the brain works is by is through population encoding by a group of neurons who are generalizers. Individual neurons generalize. The brain works through generalization. We are prone to generalize. That's how our brain works. Often, as in the case of low level sensory processing, the generalization works out for the best. We make the right identification. When it comes to interacting with human beings, generalization does not work very well. Let's talk about another part of the brain, the insula. The insular cortex, or just the insula for short, drop the R, is called that because it's part of the cortex that's found inside the biggest fold of the cortex. So this is a view of the, of the brain cutting cross section like this. And you can see this major, major fold in here. The cortex on the inside of that fold is called the insula. And the insula is active when the person feels disgust. The insula is associated with disgust. Two other parts of the brain that are important for the experiment we'll be talking about in a minute are parts of the limbic system. The limbic system forms a, forms a circular or limbic region kind of on the inside of the brain here. It includes all of these structures. I point out the cingulate cortex is an important limbic structure. The anterior cingulate cortex is the front part. The posterior cingulate, cor cingulate cortex is the back part. The anterior cingulate cortex is involved in detection of conflict. It monitors different parts of the brain, and if it detects a conflict in those places, it becomes active, it takes action. Another part of the limbic system important for our discussion is the prefrontal cortex. It's not indicated here, but prefrontal cortex is the seat of reason, but it's also involved in processing emotion. So all of these limbic regions have a, take a, a part, play a role in the processing of emotion, and so does the insula. So I want to describe the results of an experiment done back in 2004, but it involves how people perceive candidates for political office. As you probably know, the United States is entering its political season. The, um, the debate between the Republicans and the Democrats over who will be the next president of the United States has come to a head. As you probably know, the election coming up will be between 
Donald Trump and Joseph Biden. It's likely to be a rather acrimonious one. In the more genteel days in 2004, George Bush was running against John Kerry. George Bush was the Republican candidate. John Kerry was the Democratic candidate in that election. George Bush won. And it was during that political season that the experiment I'm about to describe was done. So subjects were asked their political party of preference during the 2004 presidential campaign and were then showed the faces of George Bush or John Kerry. Certain brain regions were significantly more active when the subject viewed the candidate from the opposing party, opposing party. So if you showed a Republican a picture of George Bush, nothing much would happen in their brain. For a Republican, presumably, looking at George Bush, everything is fine. If you showed a, a, a Republican a, a photograph of John Kerry, oh, now all of a sudden these brain regions become active, vice versa. If you showed a Democrat a picture of George Bush, a whole bunch of brain regions would get active. I, I, I can assure you that would be true now. If you showed a Democrat a picture of Donald Trump, I'm sure these brain regions would become very active. What are they? The regions included the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, the insula, and the anterior cingulate cortex. What is this telling us about how the brain is operating? When individuals viewed the candidate of the opposite party, there was increased activity in the insula, anterior cingulate cortex, and dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. I'm not so concerned about the dorsolateral here. We're talking about prefrontal cortex. Yes, it has different regions and they can be specialized for different things. It's not really clear what they're specialized for though. So I tend not to worry too much about subregions of prefrontal cortex. We can think of the prefrontal cortex in a more general way. Okay, briefly, the insula is associated with disgust, anterior cingulate cortex with conflict, prefrontal cortex with rational thought. So what's going on in this experiment? Well, activity in the insula is related to disgust and may have been active when viewing the opposing candidate for that reason. What this is saying is that political partisans are disgusted by the candidate from the opposing party. The dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, also part of the limbic system, but with activity more related to rational thought. Its activity was correlated with the difference between how each subject felt about the two candidates. So if a person was highly partisan, they felt really strongly about those two candidates, they actually had a lot of activity in their prefrontal cortex. Activity in this region may indicate elicitation of cognitive control mechanisms. Yes, indeed. The prefrontal cortex is the main brain region in our controlled processes. The insula is an important brain region in our automatic processes. So an individual is looking at the image of a candidate from the opposing party and their insula is active because they're disgusted by that candidate. Prefrontal cortex is also active, possibly trying to control that impulse, maybe saying, this is a democracy and we need to be able to, to communicate rationally with each other. The anterior cingulate cortex is also active. It's part of the limbic system. It works with prefrontal cortex and it forms a network that monitors conflict and recruits cognitive control when necessary. So what we might imagine is happening here is the insular response by being disgusted. The prefrontal cortex says, hey, wait a minute. This is a democracy and, we, and we, need to, we need to debate rationally. And the anterior cingular cortex detects the conflict between insula and prefrontal cortex. And these three work together to somehow resolve the conflict. We'll talk about this three-part interaction more in part two. For now, it's, it's interesting to point out that our political attitudes are as much a part of our automatic processes as our control processes. And so much of our opinions about other things are also. 
it's really a combination of our instincts and emotions and our rational thought and our knowledge. What about genetics? Do genetics determine our political points of view? Yes, to some extent they do. To some extent they do. What they're looking at here are kinship relationships. So they're looking at twins and other and people who are also related or not related. They're comparing people who have all of their genes in common, half of their genes in common, and none of their genes in common. On their political attitudes, these 26 different aspects of political opinion. And by comparing how much people agree with how genetically related they are, they can kind of infer how much of those political attitudes is due to genes versus environment. And here they're, they're, they're um, showing the, the genetic component in blue, and they're dividing the environment into two, unique environment and shared environment. So the shared environment between two siblings would be their home, their family life. The unequal environment would be things that might have happened to, those, to one of those siblings and not the other. Like one may have suffered an accident, for example. And they're, they're including twins, both monozygotic and dizygotic twins. Monozygotic twins have 100% of their genes in common. Dizygotic twins have 50% of their genes in common, like regular siblings. But dizygotic twins were born from the same womb at the same time into the same family situation. Other siblings could be born at different times in the life of a family. Their family life might be very different depending upon when they're born into that family. Adoptive siblings have almost none of their genes in common, but they have the same family life. And then complete strangers have very little genetics in common and they have no family situations in common, probably. So by comparing the, the political attitudes of people who were more or less genetically related, they were able to infer how much of these different attitudes depended on genes versus environment. And I call your attention to a couple. Down here, overall ideology, liberal versus conservative, whether you're liberal versus conservative, a very, very hot issue right now in the United States and other countries. It's uh, almost half genetic according to this analysis. Now I often say that we are the way we are 50% due to genes and 50% due to, due to environment. That the nature nurture is 50-50. 50% nature, genes, 50% nurture, environment. You can see here, if you look across all these different political opinions and attitudes, it's probably less genetic than that. It's more environmental than genetic. So 50-50 is an overstatement. It's probably more cultural than genetic, but still, there's a pretty strong genetic component. There's evidence for a pretty strong genetic component in lots of these different attributes. Political knowledge, overall ideology, right-wing authoritarianism. On the other end of the spectrum, we get political party identification. You'd think that that would go hand in hand with that. you think that political party identification would be directly related to overall ideology. But political party identification is almost not genetic at all. It's mostly apparently due to the shared environment, the environment that kids grew up in, their family structure and their town and a little bit to unequal environment. So anyway, according to this analysis, which is an estimate, um, these political, these different political attitudes do have some genetic basis, but there's also a huge environmental component. Another way of looking at it is to compare directly monozygotic and dizygotic twins with each other and see how well their opinions correlate at different ages in their lives. So here the monozygotic are in pink and the dizygotic are in blue at different ages from age, you know, nine or 10 up through old age. And you can see that where kids might start to have a political opinion preteen and teenage years, um, first of all, the correlations in their views are, can get kind of high, right? This is how much two, what these bars show, the height of the bar is proportional to how much two monozygotic twins agree politically, or two dizygotic twins agree politically, if they're both Republicans, say, uh, if they're both in favor of um, gun ownership, say. 
and you know, in their late teens, uh, their cor the correlations are pretty high. One would be a perfect correlation. So 0.6, 0.7 is pretty high. Above 0.7 is pretty high. And they agree, they're correlated. Whether the twins are monozygotic or dizygotic, in their teens, they have pretty similar views about politics, about religion, and other things, philosophy. But what happens after about age 21? Well, then typically in the West, in North America, uh, kids leave the house. They go and they move out, they get a job or they go to college. And at that point, when, when these young adults now leave their family environment, now the monozygotic continue their correlation, they continue to be largely in accordance on political and, and social matters, but the, the dizygotics diverge. They correlate, they're correlated much less. So it's this, what this graph shows at once is that yes, there's a big influence of environment that once the dizygotic twins and the monozygotic twins have a different environment, the dizygotics start to disagree more. But the monozygotics continue to agree to, to a large extent. It shows both the genetic influence and the environmental difference influence. Okay, so these are these are people who agree agree or not correlated with how genetically similar they are. There's clearly a genetic component. What genes? Genes for what proteins? Well, here's a breakdown of some of the studies that they analyzed. Over here we have phenotype. What's phenotype? Phenotype goes hand in hand with genotype. Genotype is the characteristics of the genes. Phenotype is the characteristics of the organism, which was encoded by those genes. And here the phenotypes they're interested in are ideology, li liberal versus conservative, Partisan attachment in America, Democrat or Republican. Voter turnout, violence. These are the names of the genes that they, identif they can identify as being different, possibly different. These are partic particular markers, particular polymorphisms that have been identified. Sometimes they, the polymorphism is known, sometimes it's not known. It's just, there's just, they just know there's a difference. This is the description of the gene. The gene encodes a protein which is involved in a particular system in the, in, the, in the overall organism. What is it? Well, the first two are glutamate. That's a neurotransmitter. Dopaminergic, one of the, one of the um, monoaminergic neurotransmitters. Serotonin, another monoaminergic neurotransmitter. G protein coupled receptors, all monoaminergic transmitters are G protein coupled. Dopaminergic system, serotonergic system, monoamine oxidase, that's the enzyme that breaks down the monoamines. So if you look over these genes, more than half of them are involved in neurotransmitter systems, specifically the monoaminergic neurotransmitter system, the big three monoamines, serotonin, dopamine, and noradrenaline, that determine our mood. Interestingly, some of them are also associated with the olfactory system. That's interesting. But most of them are, are genes for proteins involved in the transmitter systems that we've been discussing in this course. That's pretty interesting. Does that mean that differences in the genes for the proteins that make up your monoaminergic neurotransmitter systems can determine your political point of view? Not necessarily. This column is interesting. It shows whether the finding that this particular gene with that with this particular description really did determine your political ideology or not most of these were not replicated in most cases no replication was attempted a lab found this possible genetic difference in people of different political orientations but no lab no lab uh, bothered to verify it in one case they tr in a few cases they tried but failed to replicate so these genes weren't really in, involved in that phenotype anyway. One study actually replicated 
but within the same study. So it was the same group of people, the same lab, in fact, the same published report where there was a, a, um, there was a verification. But in no case, in not one of these cases, was there a, was there a uh, replication of the, a successful replication of the finding in an independent lab. Most experimental findings linking genetic markers to political ideology have not been independently replicated. So yes, apparently there is a genetic component to political attitudes. Pretty much just like everything else about us, it's partly nature and partly nurture. It's partly genetic and it's partly environmental. And that includes political attitudes. But whether or not we can trace a particular political attitude to a specific genetic mutation is not clear. And we probably can't. There are probably too many different things that go into determining political orientation for it, for it, to, it to be identifiable, traceable, to a specific gene. In part two, we'll discuss um, more racial bias, but I'll end part one here.